Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Oldham, Director of New Canaan Library, and it is my immense pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. I am extremely disheartened that I have to go participate in a board meeting of the library, and I'm going to miss the rest of the lecture, uh, because this is something I'm really, really interested in, and I think is so important, and I'm so glad that Isabella has come. I'd like to thank Elm Street Books for partnering with us, as ever, and being here this evening to help uh, to sell uh, Isabella's book. In Wilding, Isabella tells how she and her husband, Charles Burrow, rewilded Nep Estate, their 3,500-acre farm in southern England. They were losing money on farming, and after take, talking with a variety of experts, decided to take a chance to see if the farm could go wild. If they let nature take its course, they wondered, would the flora and fauna return? That's what happened, in Isabella's own words. We had no idea NEP would end up a focal point for today's most pressing problems, climate change, soil restoration, food quality and security, crop pollination, carbon sequestration, water resources and purification, flood mitigation, animal welfare, and human health. The editors of Smithsonian Magazine chose the UK edition of Wilding as one of their 10 best science books of 2018. Tim Flannery reviewed it in the New York Review of Books in May, and last month, Roxana Robinson wrote a travel piece in Washington Post about her visit to Nepa State, and Forbes chose Wilding as the best book about climate change, conservation, and the environment for 2018. I learned about Wilding because my daughter works for a podcast in the UK, and they featured Isabella last month. And so it was my great surprise after listening to the podcast two days later to see our own publicity put up the same book. So I was delighted when Amara asked me tonight if I could do the introduction because she's poorly and has no voice left. Isabella Tree is an award-winning author, a travel writer, and manager of the NEP Wildland Project. Together with her husband, Charlie, she has contributed to writing National Geographic, Granta, Sunday Times, Observer articles, and she has been chosen for the Best American Travel Writer Writing Award, Reader's Digest, Today's Best Nonfiction, and is the author of several books, including The Living Goddess and The Birdman. She lives in England. Please welcome to the podium, Isabella Tree. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Never been in New Canaan before. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. Um, we wake up um, every day, it seems, with new catastrophic news about what we're doing to the planet. Um, a couple of months ago, the UN produced a report saying that we are in danger of losing a million species going extinct in our world um, in the next few decades. We have five, three trillion pieces of plastic floating, sorry, seven trillion pieces of plastic floating in our, in our oceans. And uh, just last week, I think it was, we had um, a report saying that North America has lost three billion birds from its skies since the 1970s. So the great American biologist, E.O. Wilson, in one of his recent books, Half Earth, says that if we are to return, reclaim some of this biodiversity, stop the catastrophic falls. And if we are to recover the, the systems, the natural processes that actually we as a species also depend on, we have to devote half of Earth to nature. We've got to be generous. Half of Earth has to go back to nature. The question is, how do we do that? So this is really a, a very small story. I mean, compared with Half Earth, this is a blip, a tiny microspec um, in, in southeast England. But we're beginning to understand that it actually has um, big repercussions because it, um, it addresses all these other problems. Uh, apart from biodiversity, some of the most pressing problems on our planet, like climate change and carbon sequestration and soil restoration, just to name a few. So it's a small story, it's a personal story, but it is also a story of hope. And it's a very practical story because I think it shows how one way that we can, we can roll this out and actually get um, nature back into our world, into, the, into our own backyards. So we're talking about this tiny speck in um, southeast England 
Um, it's in the most sort of busiest, um, I mean, at the moment it's being built up all around us. You can imagine the pressure from Europe and London and how busy that southeast of England is. We're underneath the Gatwick stacking system. Um, but this is where we are, three and a half thousand acre estate um, that we inherited from Char my husband Charlie's grandparents in the 1980s. And this is the house that sits in the middle of it where we live. It's, um, it's a Nash castle built by um, the architect John Nash um, in about 1804. And it sits um, in the middle of this estate, the three and a half thousand acre estate. And it, uh, for most of the decades that I've known it, uh, was an intensive arable and dairy farm. Uh, but we, um, it wasn't always so. This is what happened. Um, until, until the um, Second World War, actually most of it was pasture, a lot of it was scrubland. But in the Second World War, you're probably all familiar with the Dig for Victory campaign in Britain, when our supply lines were all cut and uh, Britain was facing starvation, the UK government uh, pressured, or there was no question actually, farmers had to, uh, landowners had to turn their land to give it over to the war effort to produce food. So cricket pitches were plowed up, village greens, even the South Downs, these beautiful rolling hills that we look onto in Sussex that were sacrosanct even in the First World War, um, were plowed up for the war effort. And here we see the Repton Park, a landscape park that had probably never been plowed ever in history, um, being plowed up for the war effort. And you can see in Charlie, Charlie's grandmother's writing her proud statement, a fine wheat crop. I mean, people were proud to do this because it was a moment of crisis. It was, we were desperate. Um, you can see in the background um, the Duke of Gloucester reviewing the Canadian army who were stationed at Nep during the war. But this was a moment of crisis, and it's something we've forgotten about. Even during the war, and certainly in the, in the years after it, rationing, I think, was only abolished in about 19, 1956, um, uh, agronomists were still saying we're already beginning to warn the government that we were losing our soils, that this idea of maximum production, which was tilling, plowing every single year and producing monocrops without ad infinitum, was dangerous for our soils. And they were urging the government to go back to the much more stable rotational system whereby you leave land fallow in order to recover your soils and to, and to have grazing animals as part of that crop rotation. But like the rest of the world, Europe and America, we went down this idea, this route of um, industrialized farming and maximum production at all costs. Um, it was driven, of course, by the sort of discovery of chemical fertilizers. Um, it's, it's no irony that sort of um, after the war, um, the great munitions factories that had been producing um, bombs were turned into factories that could produce nitrates, that could produce fertilizer. And so, of course, that drove a system where we could produce crops without the rotational, old rotational systems of concerning ourselves about the soils. And they were very dramatic to begin with. But what we, what we didn't realize was that this was a very short-term um, prospect. We weren't looking at the long term. We know now that we have, uh, we have degraded our soils so much from this repeated tillage and and the plow, I'm beginning to realize, is the worst invention that man ever came up with, um, that this repeated plowing and use of chemicals which destroy the soil structure and all the soil biota has destroyed our soils completely. So we now, according to some scientists, have 100 harvests left in the globe before our agricultural soils are gone forever. And that's they are, they are blown off um, into the winds or they are washed off into the sea down our rivers. So... This was not a solution for the long term, and we're just beginning to realize how disastrous this, this industrialized system has been for us. And of course, it started producing food in massive, massive quantities. So we are now producing food to feed 11 billion people on the planet, and we are 7.5 or whatever it is now. So that is something that's often not mentioned by the food and farming industry. We waste 40% of that food. Um, Charlie, my husband, and I have just been... Um, doing some talks in California. We drove up the, the West Coast. And we were driving through um, field after field of things like red peppers that had tiny blemishes on them. They were perfectly edible, but they weren't going to be harvested because of those little blemishes. 
we drove through orange groves and uh, grapefruit groves that the commodity price had changed and they weren't worth harvesting this year. So we are still overproducing um, food, and that um, is in itself a big problem. So this is what most of Britain looks like now. Um, it's still under this in this mindset of maximum production, so almost every inch of lowland Britain that can be plowed up is plowed up, and we think that this is perfectly normal. What we don't appreciate, I think, is how that is affected biodiversity. So uh, since the Second World War, we've plowed up 75,000 miles of hedgerows. We've lost 97% of our wildflower meadows. Almost all our lowland heathland has gone, and almost all our lowland wetland. And the consequence for biodiversity has been absolutely shattering. So most of our species are just falling off this cliff edge. They're still continuing to fall. Declines of between 60 to 90% in most cases. So it really is catastrophic, has had this catastrophic impact. Um, what was surprising to me when I was researching this book was that I thought, well, okay, this is, this is something that um, is inevitable, perhaps. This is what's happening the world over, and what we've done in, in the UK can't be as bad as all that. Um, but in the latest nature, uh, State of Nature Biodiversity Index, they've measured biodiversity, uh, a countries according to their biodiversity, the UK rates 29th from the bottom of 123 countries. So what we've done since the Second World War, since this dig for victory kind of push, has, has really been catastrophic on, on a world scale. So this was NEP 20 years ago. And we thought that this was normal. And we thought that we would continue. And this is how our, uh, you know, our lives would be um, creating this kind of um, landscape. Uh, when we took over uh, in the 1980s from Charlie's grandparents, um, we fully expected to be farmers for the rest of our lives. Charlie had been um, uh, trained at uh, Sirencester Agricultural College. The problem we faced when taking over this farm was that it was losing money hand over fist. So this in, in intensive arable and dairy farm we inherited was, was in severe problems. And we assumed, I think, with the kind of... Um, the sort of perhaps the arrogance of youth, um, that it was all down to Charlie's grandparents. Um, we assumed, you know, they hadn't invested in infrastructure. They didn't know the latest technologies. Charlie was a, a child of the Green Revolution, a misnomer if ever there was one. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he felt that he could turn this business around. And so for the next 17 years, that's what we did. We did what every good farmer is supposed to do. We bought bigger machinery, we made efficiencies, we invested in infrastructure, we amalgamated six rather old dairies into three state-of-the-art, all singing, all dancing dairies with, with milking parlors that looked like something out of NASA. Um, we even tried to diversify. We, we, we bought, um, hu uh, we, we exchanged, we sold um, these beautiful old breed, dual purpose red pole cattle that had been the darlings of Charlie's grandparents. And, uh, we sold them, um, and instead we bought Holstein and Frisians, you know, the modern factory cows for dairy. Um, and then we tried to diversify, to, to add value to that milk, and we, we started creating ice cream, and we were about to go national, actually. It was, it, it, we, we, were, we, were, we were very successful at that until um, haagen the Darth Vader of ice cream companies, <laughs> came over to Britain um, and uh, blew us out of the galaxy. Um, uh, we also, of course, tried to inc improve the yields of our crops, and, 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 um, and thereby we started throwing more and more and more chemicals at the land. So more nitrates, more fertilizer, more pesticides, more herbicides, more fungicides. Sometimes these were several times on one particular crop every year to try and increase the yields. And still, after 16 or 17 years, we were still losing money. Um, we were one and a half million pounds in debt by 1999, and we knew we couldn't go on. The reason was this, it's clay. I don't know if any of you have ever lived or farmed on clay, but my God, we are on 320 meters of this stuff over a bedrock of limestone. It's called the old, the Sussex wheel, the low wheel. And in the summer, you can, you can stick your hand down a crack up to your up to your elbow, up to your shoulder, rather. And in the winter, it's like unfathomable porridge. Um, I, think the, I think the Inuit are supposed to have dozens of different words for snow, aren't they? But um, in, um, 
In Sussex, we have 35 different words for mud. That is how much it governs our lives. So in a wet winter, you, you sometimes just cannot get heavy machinery onto the land for six months. So you can't um, sow spring crops. You can't uh, maintain your ditches. You can't do any maintenance at all, in fact. So you're out of action for six months of a year, and that means you are totally uncompetitive. You cannot compete in a global market with farms on lovely, beautiful, loamy soils. It took us 16 years to realize this. Um, and when we did realize, um, Charlie was very brave about it because I think, um, you know, a lot of people, are some of our neighbors, are still trying to farm this land. And I think he made the brave decision to, to stop farming. Um, and it was brave because it was a, a cultural shift. It was, it was very much going against the grain, I mean, in every sense of the word, because um, it, was, it was a very sad and distressing decision to make anyway. We had to um, dismiss our um, farm manager, who was a friend. We had to make nine men redundant. And you know they had children in the local primary school. Um, we had to say goodbye to three of the best dairy herds in the country. They're consistently ranked in the top 10 herds in the country. So we weren't bad farmers. And we um, sold all our farm machinery and uh, our cows and our milk quota, and we cleared our debts. But I think it was also the perception of our neighbors and the family um, that you know, we were doing something that was essentially non-British. You know, we were accused even of being unpatriotic. That's how deep the, 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 sort of the, the, the message goes about digging for victory. There's still this idea that we, we are in a crisis and we need to, to produce food on every single inch of land. So it was not looked on favorably, this decision to, to change farming, but to, from to farming, but we knew we had to do it. And I don't know if any of you have ever been in the unfortunate position of being in a failing business, but um, it really means that you're very, very blinkered a lot of the time. You're looking for every upturn, every flag that's going to show you that next week, next month, your, your fortunes might turn up again. You, know, you might be able to last till next year. But you're thinking very much in the same mindset, and you're hugely stressed. So you're thinking about the bank balance, and you haven't got headspace to think creatively. Once Charlie had made the decision to stop farming, it was unbelievably liberating. We could sit back and we could look at the position and our land and what we should be doing with it with a completely open mind. Um, and it was really liberating. So it was in that frame of mind, being very kind of open to ideas, that we met this remarkable man, um, Franz Vera, who's standing there um, with the gray hair on the right. He's a Dutch ecologist, and he um, had just published in English um, a book called Grazing Ecology and Forest History. And this was published in 2000, so the year that we had our farm machinery sale and we got out of farming. So it was perfect timing, as it were. Um, and we sort of embraced what he was saying with kind of genuine interest. Because what he's saying is even now, I think, changing the way ecologists and uh, naturalists and co conservationists think, um, it's still sending shockwaves through this, this world. What he's saying is that in all our imaginings of how the world, our landscape, looked pre-human impact, what we tend to forget are the huge herds of megafauna, the herbivores that would have been in our landscapes before human impact. So in temperate zone Europe in particular, we have this sort of tradition that temperate zone Europe would have been a closed canopy forest. And it wasn't until, in a kind of rather Freudian way, um, man came along with his axe and chopped down the virgin forest and sowed his seed in the virgin soil that we started to get a more interesting and open landscape. But what France is saying is that if you remember the, herbiv the herbivores that would have been there in the first place, if you think of the aurochs, the tarpan, bison, reindeer, elk, um, uh, wild boar, beavers by the million, it would have looked, Europe would have looked much, much more like um, Africa, like the Serengeti. And so would so many places in the world, because we're missing these huge numbers of megafauna. So these, are, these aren't even species. These are genera of megafauna that have gone extinct post-human impact. And you can see that in Africa and in Europe and Asia, 
um, the, the, the genera, uh, uh, the loss, the species losses, um, are relatively low. And we think that's because these animals co-evolved with human beings. So as these rather strange apes started learning how to chuck spears at things, these animals learned how to be defensive, or at least how to run away. So there wasn't such a huge impact. But in other parts of the world where human beings have never been before, like Australia and North and South America, the impact was enormous. And these landscapes have changed beyond recognition. So we need to have, I think, in the back of our heads, these missing ghosts of what, would, what our, our vegetation would have co-evolved with. And imagine the impact, the trampling, browsing, browsing trashing, general trashing of vegetation that would have happened with these animals and the, and the importance they are as vectors of seeds, of minerals, of nutrients around landscapes and how different and how much more dynamic our landscapes would have been when we had them. So what France is saying is that if we want to recover biodiversity and the natural systems that, um, that work in our, in our landscapes, the way we do that is to put these megafauna back. And that is when exciting things begin to happen and the dynamism that's needed to kickstart very depleted, plateaued um, ecosystems can, can begin to produce again. It's the kind of impetus that pulls the glider back into the sky so it can fly. So we were really intrigued by this idea. And we thought, well, if we could do an experiment like this on our land, on our severely depleted post-agricultural soils in the southeast of England, surrounded by A roads, um, in the most unpromising place in Britain. Um, and if we could increase biodiversity, even by a fraction, it would be a really interesting experiment to, to try. So that's what we did. And um, my husband had a very happy summer, smashing up all the, every boy's dream, I think, smashing up all the old Victorian drains that had been trying very ineffectually to get water off our land. Um, we took up about 77 miles of internal fences and gateposts and barbed wire. Think of the cost of that in infrastructure terms for a farmer to keep maintained. Um, and we uh, let our ditches silt up, another burden released from us. And we let this vegetation pulse then begin to happen. So after we left our arable fields um, out of, of, of their last harvest, we allowed thorny scrub to come up. And within that thorny scrub, we started to see the first young saplings of our next generation of trees beginning to emerge. So this is how natural regeneration happens. It can, we don't need to stick a, a, a spade in the ground with a tantalized wooden stake and a polypropylene tube and a sapling from a nursery which may be bringing in disease. We don't have to plant trees. The trees will do it themselves if they're given the right conditions and just allowed to do it. So this was all happening, and we were beginning to see that even in the very, very early days, we were onto something exciting. The, the sound of insects was something that we hadn't even noticed as farmers that we were missing. And of course, when the insects came back, we suddenly got birds in our skies again. And again, we, we, we had previously just, we, we, we hadn't thought we were irresponsible. We actually, I suppose, like most farmers, considered ourselves to be stewards of the land. It wasn't until we let go, and this burgeoning of life started coming back that we realized that we had not at all been stewards of the land and how far we'd been going wrong. So it took, anyway, um, we knew we were onto a good thing, but it did take about six or seven years to persuade the government that we were, the, we were not completely as mad as um, hatters. And so they eventually um, managed to, uh, 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 saw that there was some method in our madness. And, and um, uh, gave us the funding to uh, provide um, a ring fence around the whole area so that then we could introduce the animals. So, I mean, interestingly, this hiatus where we'd allowed the vegetation pulse to happen was actually a positive one for rewilding because it meant that the, we had some vegetation structure there that could then start to do battle with the animal disturbance. And that's where you get the real dynamic um, landscape. That's where you get the sort of kaleidoscope of habitats crashing into each other, um, which is all kind of fantastic, um, sort of rocket fuel for biodiversity. So the key thing, I think, that, that um, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of sort of misrepresentation about rewilding in the, in the press, particularly. Um, it is not about going back to the past and recovering some idyllic landscape pre-humans. 
Um, what, what, all we're doing, I think, is, is looking back at the past and understanding what happened in the past and using that as inspiration for what can happen in the future. So we can't go back. We don't, we've lost all these species. Our planet has so completely changed, mostly thanks to humans. But um, what we can do is we can use the tools at our disposal now to get systems working again. And these may be novel ecosystems, things that have never been existing before on our planet. But if they work, if biodiversity climbs, if all the other systems kick into play, then that is worth doing. That is the way that our world is going to be going forward. So if you have lost a lot of your megafauna, um, and in Europe we lost the aurochs and we lost the tarpan, the original um, horse, um, and we jolly nearly um, hunted to extinction bison, although they are now coming back in, in Europe. Um, and interestingly, you know, you gave us the horse from North America, but we gave you the bison. Um, but we jolly nearly, and we gave you wolves and beavers too, um, but we jolly nearly lost our bison. And we jolly nearly lost beavers too. I think our beavers were down to a, a population in 12 tiny places in Europe and Asia, to about 1,200 individuals. So we jolly nearly lost them. But they are now back um, uh, in their millions, I'm pleased to say. Not, unfortunately, in Britain yet. Um, they're coming back, we hope. We've just applied for a license to release them, but you know, we're waiting to hear if that's going to be accepted by the government. Um, but uh, what you can do, though, is you can use proxies for these missing megafauna. You can even use their descendants. So um, we lost our aurochs, the original cow. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the cave paintings of Lascaux 17,500 years ago, but this is a cave painting of an aurochs, and here is our aurochs. It's an old English longhorn, um, and we choose deliberately choose old breeds because they still have the traits of their ancestors, and we, we think that they even probably have similar gut flora. Um, so they're going to be producing a similar in, impact on the, on the landscape. So the, our aurochs, um, <laughs> happily munching away, is demonstrating to us at NEP that cows don't just eat grass. They evolved as a species that browse as well as graze. And this is hugely important because they are really important vectors of seeds. Uh, an, an old English longhorn can transport 230 different spe seed species in its gut, its hooves, and its fur. So it's a hugely important way of getting plants uh, transferred around a landscape. They'll eat in one place, move sometimes for miles, and dung out those seeds in a perfect pile of compost ready to take off. But they're also, of course, transporting minerals and nutrients around the landscape. And that's a dynamic that we've completely forgotten about in our very static systems of farming today, where animals stay in one place, they eat, they're taken off, those nutrients are endlessly taken off the same patch of land. But in former times, these herds would have moved from the coast all the way up to mountaintops, moving nutrients around. And big disturbers, like you see those bulls there, turfing up um, the ground with their hooves. And then we have our Exmoor pony standing in for the tarpan. That, that's a tarpan in, in, in Lascaux on the cave paintings. And look how phenotypically similar they are. Um, the Exmoor pony is one of our oldest European breeds of pony. It survived um, in a small group in Exmoor um, in the west country of Britain. It was down to 40 individuals in the Second World War. Um, partly, I'm afraid to say, because the English army used it as target practice. Um, but um, it is now coming back, and we have um, one of the largest breeding herds um, at NEP. Um, it's still rarer than the giant panda, but it is definitely on its way back, and it's showing its worth as an animal that can be introduced into rewilding systems. So what's so interesting is one of the things that we've completely forgotten about is how these animals relate to each other. Um, Exmoor ponies are contributing a completely different thing to the cattle in our system. Um, Princeton University are doing a really interesting study on this in Kenya, where they've done um, a research program into equine and bovine relationships. And what they found is, um, I, I love it because it's so completely counterintuitive and it just illustrates how um, surprising rewilding can be. But what they've, what they've um, demonstrated is that if you have 100 head of cattle in a given area and you allow those cattle to graze alongside a bov uh, uh, an equine, and that could be a pony, it could be a donkey, it could even be a zebra. Those 100 head of cattle will put on more weight, more condition, 
than if they're grazing that area on their own. And how can that happen? You'd think they would be competing for the same resource, but they're not. You can see here that the ponies are eating much rougher, coarser grasses than the cattle. They're even um, eating thistles, which the cattle just cannot stomach. So what happens is the horses go through the landscape, taking out all the rough stuff, and that enables the sweeter grasses to evolve, which is what benefits the cattle. So I have this idea in my head, this sort of image um, of thousands of years ago. You would have had tarpan moving through the landscape, and in their wake, you would have had aurochs grazing on the habitats that the tarpan had released for them. And I think the system would have been very much the same in North America. You would have had your horses, which came from here originally, um, freeing up the landscape for bison and for, um, I think there was a, also a, a, a type of bo another type of bovang in, in North America um, that would have been benefiting from this, this grazing and browsing by the, by the, the um, equine. And then we've got three different types of deer. So we've got red deer, fallow deer, and roe deer. Again, same sort of principle, different mouthpieces in the landscape, doing different things, eating different de de vegetation, creating a much more complex vegetation structure. The more animals, the more different species you can put in the mix, the more um, diversity you get back. And obviously in the rut, which is happening now, um, the red deer and the fallow deer particularly are very big disturbers. So they'll turf up the soil with their antlers, the um, fallow deer will create these huge lecking sites where they just have arenas which they just cover in urine, and then they, scent, you know, they rub their scent glands everywhere. The, at this very moment at NEP, the air is just like filled with testosterone. It's this pungent smell. Um, and everything they do it, when they rub their scent glands on a, on a branch, that's opening up a niche for another insect or lichen or whatever. The domino effect continues. And then my favorite, the Tamworth pig, um, standing in for wild boar. What's astonishing is that when you release domesticated animals into a landscape like this, they're full of surprises. I mean, who would have thought that um, Tamworth pigs could behave like hippos? But we've actually watched them diving. They can hold their breath for 20 seconds. We time them. They can hold their breath and dive to the bottom of our ponds. And they'll pull up um, swan mussels, these big freshwater swan mussels, which they'll pull to the bank pull them apart with their trotters and take out the flesh in the inside. So what we're now realizing when we look at these animals is that, you know, when, I, when, I, when we were farming, I used to look at our dairy herds, and um, they'd be in a field with their heads down eating grass, and I thought they were nice animals but pretty boring. But of course, it's not the animal that's boring. It's a situation we put them in that's boring. And you release them into this, this landscape, and they suddenly reveal their curiosity, their ingenuity, their whole, their full sort of spectrum of behaviors. Their instincts are still there, and they can still come back and, and be really key drivers of a system. And of course, what the pigs are doing for us is, um, is rootling. So that's another important impact. Um, you can imagine um, how difficult it is for seeds to penetrate a thick, grassy sward if it's, um, if it's an area of pasture. So just the pig opening it up just that little bit can release very quickly. It can become um, a really complex um, um, colonization of, and I am really, really, really trying never to say the word weed again. These are our native, <laughs> native wildflowers. And I think just like in America, we in Britain do not appreciate these. Um, we have zero tolerance for them, not only in our arable fields, our arable landscapes, where we can very effectively get rid of them with herbicides, but we don't even like them in our gardens. We think of them as thugs, and we think of them as taking over our, from our wonderful exotics. And we don't even like them on our roadside verges. We like our roadside verges looking like lawns and, and moan and moan and moan. But of course, these, these plants, which again are rapidly declining in Britain as in elsewhere in the world, um, they have co-evolved with insects. Some insects will, will be so species-specific that they'll only have one flower that they will pollinate. Um, but also, these species have um, very tiny, protein-rich seeds, which many of our birds depend on. So this crashing um, populations um, of, of wildflowers has huge impacts on, on the rest of our wildlife. So this is NEP when it was under the farming regime. Imagine yourself as a bird flying over that. You're not going to really want to linger there for very long. And this is how it's begun to heal itself under rewilding. 
Um, so much more complex habitat, much more like a kind of open wood pasture system. And this is what much of it looks like from the ground. So it's a kaleidoscope of, of habitats. We've got um, uh, wildflower meadows, we've got water, water lags, we've got boggy bits, we've got areas that the animals seem to prefer and want to keep open for grazing lawns. Um, we've got um, uh, wood pasture, we've got groves of trees, and, but a lot of it is this thorny scrub, the stuff that appeared in the first place. And it's, again, it's something, it's a habitat that we have zero tolerance for in the modern day. Most people look at this and call it scrub and put in those huge machines to take it out. But it is one of the most biodiverse habitats there is because it's a kind of in-between, it's a transitional stage. And this has, it's, it's, got, it's got a plethora of seeds and berries um, and, and flowers too. But also the thorniness protects your um, small mammals, your birds, your insects even, from predation. So this is why it's just kind of like this it, the hugely heaving mass of, of, of wildlife. And now at NEP, we have, I mean, when you go out into this kind of landscape, you're almost deafened by the noise. And we're changing the baseline for a lot of naturalists who come and do their monitoring and surveying at NEP. They cannot believe how, how, how much life can fit onto this piece of land. Um, but obviously, we should be much, much more ambitious for the kind of um, explosion of life that we want to have back in our landscapes. And the key thing um, in our, our system, um, it's, it's a, the, the, the sort of a key idea of rewilding is that it's process-led. So really, you're trying to allow nature to express herself as much as possible. You're trying to take your hands off the steering wheel and do as little management as possible. Um, very, very difficult, much harder to, to, to do than to say for human beings. Um, but that is the principle, is that you allow the free-roaming megafauna to do the driving, to do the management for you, and you sit back and don't do anything. The one thing we do do at NEP, though, is because we are a relatively small area, we're not Yellowstone, we have 3,500 acres, we don't have apex predators. The one thing we do is we control the numbers of animals. So you don't want to have too many animals or you get an overgrazed system with which we're all familiar with from our agricultural landscape. You don't want too few animals because then the scrub will get away and your trees will start developing and soon you'll have a closed canopy woodland, which is okay for carbon sequestration, but it's actually very, um, bio, uh, very species poor and very undynamic. So from um, uh, uh, the point of view of biodiversity, you certainly want to have something in the middle. You want to have that vegetation succession coming up, and you want the animal disturbance to be battling with it. You want it a back to be a battle that's never going to be over, um, that's never going to be won. And that's when you get the sort of really creative dynamism that, that you're wanting in the system. <coughs> and so it's not just the biomass that's come back. It's not just the sheer numbers of life that we're looking at. We have now got some of the rarest species in Britain on our land. So this is within 20 years. We haven't introduced anything other than the herbivores. And we have now, um, having been one of the most depleted landscapes I can think of in Britain, we are now one of the most significant areas for nature in Britain. We've got ravens back for the first time in 100 years at NEP. Um, we've got cuckoos. They've declined 93% since the 1960s. We've got nightingales, again, similar declines of 97%, um, I think, since the 1960s. Both are breeding... Um, very, very successfully at NEP. We even tagged some cuckoos last year and watched them fly all the way to sub-Saharan Africa, and they all came back to NEP. Um, we've got lesser spotted woodpecker. We've got peregrine falcons nesting in a tree, which is almost unheard of. Um, uh, people aren't used to seeing them just nesting in a tree. And this is perhaps the most poignant of all. This is a turtle dove. Um, and to me, um, this perhaps symbolizes really what NEP has been doing more than anything else, because... When I was growing up in the 1960s, we had 125,000 pairs of turtle doves in Britain. To me, it was a common bird. It was the sound of summer. You could hear that lovely tour touring in the, in the shrubland, and it was like the cuckoo. It, it meant long summer sunny days and the holidays. We're now down to fewer than um, just a few thousand, and according to the RSPB, we are about to lose this bird entirely from Britain. It's going to go extinct in the next 10 to 15 years from Britain. And this is the bird, this is the stuff of Chaucer and Shakespeare. It's what we sing about as cow with cows. It's what my true love gave to me at Christmas. 
and we're going to lose it. It's part of our cultural DNA. So for me, um, this, this bird symbolizes so much of what's been going on in, in Britain since the, the, um, uh, since the Second World War. But at NEP, just a few years into our project, we heard our first turtle dove. No one could believe it. We hadn't had a turtle dove uh, on NEP in living memory. And suddenly, we started hearing them. This year, we had 20 singing males. You can't hear them. Um, you can't see them, rather, because they're so shy, presumably because their numbers are so low now. Um, and it's only the males that sing. But we know that we had um, 20 male territories. We know they're breeding, because we've even managed to, to ring some fledglings. So we could have had as many as 30 or 40 turtle doves on that, which is just completely bucking the trend. We're the only place in Britain where turtle dove numbers um, are actually rising. And that's because they're nesting in the thorny scrub. They've got those wheat native wild flower seeds to feed on. So they, that's, that's what they love is those tiny protein-rich seeds. And they're also finding clean water. Again, something that is very, very different to difficult to find in our landscapes today. Standing water is often polluted by nitrates or, or runoff from roads. And these birds are very fussy about having clean water because they need to produce this milk to, to feed their, their chicks. We also have all five species, UK species of owl, including the little owl here on the left, um, which is just rocketing in numbers because of um, it's a beetle specialist. And because we don't feed, our, you know, our animals are out there all year round feeding themselves. We don't supplementary feed them. We don't give them antibiotics. We don't give them wormers, which are always given to livestock in industrial situations. Um, these, our, our dung, our livestock dung is purely organic. And it has become just a magnet, a honeypot for dung beetles. Again, a keystone species, which is so important for bringing that dung back into the soil and regenerating the soil structure and the nutrients in the soil. My husband's a bit of a, a dung beetle fetishist. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm, I'm glad he's not here, because I can be rude about him. But um, he, um, uh, I couldn't work out what he was doing a couple of years ago, because he, he was following around the herd of longhorns. And whenever um, one did a cow pat, he would fall to his stomach next to it with his mobile phone and start fiddling with his mobile phone. And I couldn't understand what he was doing, but he was timing how long it took dung beetles to find the cow pat. And I think the record was under 60 seconds. <laughs> so we haven't introduced any of these species. They're just come, they're finding us. They're clinging on somewhere in tiny little specks of maybe hedgerow or forgotten bit of, of, of pasture somewhere. And they're finding us, sometimes traveling um, you know, hundreds of miles to find us. Um, his experiments weren't so popular, though, when he moved into the kitchen with his dung pats. And um, he started, you know, there was everything. It was sort of, you know, test tubes all over the surfaces and unspeakable things in the freezer. And um, he, he um, but anyway, after a very happy summer of ferreting around in the cow pats on the kitchen table, he found 23 species. His record was 23 different species of dung beetle in one cow pat, including a dung beetle called the violet door beetle, which hasn't been seen in Sussex for 50 years. It's, so it's astonishing how these are clinging on somewhere, and they'll come back given half a chance. It's just amazing. We now have 13 out of the 17 species of bat in the UK on NEP, including this one, Beckstein's bat, which is so rare, it's rare even in Europe, and we don't really know much about it at all. Um, and butterflies. We have painted, uh, sorry, we have purple emperor butterflies. Um, we are now the biggest, by far, the biggest breeding hotspot for purple emperor butterflies. And they're one of our rarest butterflies in, in Britain. I didn't even know that there was such a thing until they started kind of burgeoning at NEP. Um, they're an astonishing creature. They're our second largest butterfly. They they're a bit like a thug, actually. They're almost like an honorary bird. They are very territorial. The males will attack blue tits, anything that comes near their territory. If you throw a stick up in the air, they'll attack it. Um, what they really like, they don't just sip delicately on their flowers like most butterflies. What they really love is fox scat. That's what gets them really excited. And, um, and sap runs on oak trees. So that's sort of the ooze that oak trees get when there's a, when there's a wound on a tree um, that kind of gets them drunk. They get drunk on the, on the sap. And they're, they're real sort of thuggish butterflies. Behave much more like tropical butterflies, but they're amazing. So... 
Rewilding, how does it fit into our landscape? How does it fit into our picture um, of what we should be looking at our future landscapes? Obviously, we need to produce food from somewhere. So this is what um, most people would consider a classic British landscape, and most people would consider it beautiful. That's how they would draw their picture postcard um, image of, of Britain. So what they don't see, though, is that this is um, a biological desert, pretty much. So where we can um, change it for the better, get these systems dynamic again, get all these benefits that we're looking for, um, is this way, I think. Say up there in the top right-hand corner is your biodiversity hotspot. Hot that's your net. That's your rewilded area of, say, a few thousand acres where you've now got wildlife coming back. It's longing to spill out into the landscape. But if it spills out into that landscape, it's not going to last very long. There's no habitat there for much at all. What we need to do is, is introduce wildlife corridors. And if they're going to be effective, we've got to have bridges, um, land bridges over our roads. Um, in Britain, we are absolutely rubbish at this. We, I think we've got two or three land bridges in the whole of, of Britain. Um, a couple of years ago, we gave back something like 12 million um, pound, uh, euros to Europe um, because we hadn't spent it on land bridges. Um, uh, and, but in Europe, they're much better at it. So in the Netherlands, for example, they've got hundreds of land bridges. And they're realizing that it's really important to connect biodiversity hotspots with other areas of nature. So our small pockets of, of nature reserves or, um, or anywhere of interest, even from our, our big wildernesses, can spill out into the landscape through wildlife corridors that can actually get back eventually into our own backyards. And then, of course, we've got to return our hedgerows. So wherever we've taken our hedgerows, we've got to put them back. We've got to get them deeper, thicker, uh, be more generous with them. And we can have areas for wildlife around our fields. Um, we're just, we're, there's new um, research showing that even in conventional chemical agriculture, if you have areas for wildlife around your field, and it will look something like this, your yields go up. So you don't lose anything by sacrificing a small percentage of your land around your crops. Because what happens is that this is where you get your crop pollinators from, but you also get the insects that are feeding, the predators that are feeding on the pests the, the, uh, that, are, that, are, that are afflicting your crops. So even in conventional agriculture, this has been shown to increase yield significantly. But we can't go on the way we are. We cannot go on with chemical farming and with tillage. We absolutely cannot go on this way. We know that we're going to lose our soil soon, and it's an unsustainable system. We have to return. It's not a very good dramatic picture, but we've got to start doing uh, regenerative farming. And happily, in the States, you have some of the best pioneers in this new kind of thinking that there are. Um, you've got Joel Salatin, who, you know, who's, who, who may be familiar to you. His, his wonderful book, Folks, This Ain't Normal, is absolutely brilliant. Um, and Alan Sabre, he's actually from Zimbabwe originally, but a lot of farmers in um, in America are now following his holistic management systems. There are millions of acres now across the, the globe that are following Alan Savory's mob grazing techniques, how to even bring deserts back to life. It's absolutely astonishing. So um, if you're interested, do look into Alan Savory. Um, David Montgomery's book, Growing a Revolution, is astonishing um, about what American farmers um, are beginning to do with, with regenerative farming. And what he's showing is that you can produce just, um, just as much, if not more, food with no inputs as you can from chemical, chemical farming. And Gabe Brown is a, is a really interesting example of this. He's a North Dakota farmer who is now in the top 15% of food producers in North Dakota with no inputs whatsoever. He doesn't even irrigate during the summer, unlike all his neighbors. Um, and in the winter, his soils have, have re revived so much that they're six degrees warmer than his neighbors. So what he's done is he's extended, he's doubled his growing season. So, and he is passing on the savings, those input savings, because this is not costing him a lot anymore. He's making huge profits, but he's also passing on those savings at the farm gate. He's selling to locals for uh, cheaper food that is organic and more nutritious because it's being grown in soils that have actually restored and have got minerals and nutrients in them. So they're nutri nutrient-rich foods. 
So hugely important, his, his example, Dirt to Soil. I really recommend reading it. And he's also got a fantastic um, YouTube um, presentation. And of course, um, Elaine Ingham, who has been doing this work on the soil, she coined the, the phrase, the soil food web. And she has been doing this work for decades. But she goes around the globe now um, advising places like Jersey, where I don't know if you're familiar with um, Jersey potatoes, but um, the Channel Islands. And their soils have completely slipped into the channel. And she has gone and, and advised them how to get their soils back and get their industry back. So regenerative farming. And then, of course, we can go into um, uh, a sort of silver culture and uh, two-tier farming, um, uh, sort of where you're using trees combined with, with livestock. So we know that livestock can be hugely important for regenerating soils. So you can have all sorts of two-tier systems, like the, the, the sort of um, Spanish system, which is an amazing way they have these wonderful oak dehesas where you have your pigs eating the acorns and foraging underneath, and you have um, wonderful cork forests where you're harvesting your cork from the, from the trees. So you can have a two-tier system. And we also know that having trees in an in agricultural system also, also increases production. <coughs> and then, of course, we've got to restore our wetlands. Because we know that um, we, are, um, we have problems with drought, we have problems with floods. So we've got to learn how to store our water again. And wetlands are a hugely important um, part of that process. Um, we need to mitigate against floods so we don't have to spend so much money on hard revetments and rebuilding all the, the destruction that floods can cause. And we're going to get more and more floods with um, extreme weather events with climate change. So we have to prepare for that. We've got to learn how to store our water again and how to purify it and how to keep our water sources clean. Um, and one of the biggest, most fantastic herbivores, of course, for doing that is the beaver. Um, Keystone species, amazing hydrological engineer. We rewilded an area of our um, uh, river at Nep. It cost the taxpayer £200,000. Um, it took uh, five years, uh, two years to do. It took five years in feasibility studies. Um, and uh, we now have um, a river that is meandering again on the floodplain. But a, a couple of beavers could have done that in six months with no cost and much, much more effectively. Um, so um, let's, let's, let's welcome the beavers back. So here we are with our green and pleasant land. I hope it's not looking quite so green and pleasant. Um, and this is what we could have if we open our minds a bit and, and free ourselves into a much more dynamic landscape. And we haven't even talked about carbon sequestration. So that, that previous landscape, that will just have been leaching um, carbon out into the atmosphere because we're losing it in the soils. Um, and every time you plow and every time it rains, you're, it's just going straight into the sea. So it's, an, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest contributors to, to carbon emissions. But this landscape is the opposite. It's a carbon sink. It's one of the most powerful tools we have to combating climate change. So we know that peatland can store 3.6 tons per hectare per year. We've got to start restoring peatlands. We've got a lot of that in, in Europe and in the UK. Um, marine, if you imagine some sea uh, over that, that horizon, can store four tons per hectare per year. Species-rich grassland, 3.6, so the kind of uh, grassland we've got at NEP. Um, and trees, 12.8. And again, we're getting trees back at NEP too. And wetlands, 5.1. So suddenly, you're looking at the landscape, which is sucking down carbon into the soils and into the vegetation. So rewilding is a, a term that was coined in um, the States a, a few decades ago. And it was very much synonymous with cause, corridors, and carnivores was the kind of catchphrase that came with it. Um, I've kind of shown you how I think cores and corridors can work together in the landscape. Um, carnivores is a bit of a thornier issue, I think. If we're looking at trying to get this kind of landscape, but if we're getting rewilding back into our own backyards. Um, but having said that, um, Europe is, I think, showing the way in this. Um, three, 30 million hectares of land, of, of uh, marginal agricultural land, is being abandoned in Europe. By 2030, an area the size of Italy will have been abandoned from farming. And that is producing huge opportunities for rewilding. Um, we're already seeing predators coming back into the European landscape. Remember, Europe is half the size of um, North America, and it's much more densely populated. We now have twice as many wolves as North America, and we have 10 times as many brown bears. They're a cousin of the grizzly bear. 
And we have links in, in 23 different countries in Europe, um, 7,000 of them. So we are seeing apex predators coming back, and we're learning how to live with them. So in Germany, where there's, um, I think you'll find 10,000 euros if you shoot a wolf, they have 45 um, packs of wolves. Um, and that's up from one pack in 2001. So it can be done. We can live with them in our landscapes. Um, it's, it's always going to be a challenge, but we can get them back. So I think we still need to keep ambitious about our apex predators. Britain is so insular and so kind of risk averse that this is going to be a long challenge for us. And I'm hoping that once we can get these restored landscapes into Britain and see a lot more rewilding and joined up thinking and have some wilderness areas, proper wilderness areas back in Scotland and Wales, Maybe my grandchildren will be the generation or the great-grandchildren who can make these decisions about whether wolves and bears could come back. We are seriously looking at getting lynx back in the UK, though, which might really, um, within the next 10 years, obviously could be a possibility. But I think what we've shown at NEP is that um, it's the herbivores that can, even in the absence of apex predators, the herbivores can do so much to recover these systems. And that's, I think, where the excitement is. And it's not just for biodiversity, but it's for all these other things like carbon sequestration, soil restoration, um, flood mitigation, all these other things that we so desperately need, and even human health. So one of the things that I think has been so impressive for Charlie and me on this journey from being kind of Taliban farmers to um, the kind of the wild side um, is, is the effect that it's had on us psychologically. So that kind of feeling, that innate sort of amazing sort of leap of joy you get when you hear a turtle dove tour touring in the shrubbery on a, on a lovely warm summer's evening. It's that feeling of kind of completeness, that you belong, that you're in a landscape that is humming and thrumming and buzzing with life. E.O. Wilson has um, a wonderful word for it. It's biophilia. It's that innate desire in all of us to connect with living things. And I think that's something that we, are know, we know instinctively we're missing. The more urban we become, the more we need to connect with truly wild spaces, I think, for our own physical as well as our mental health. So the question then is, if we have so many benefits from rewilding, um, how, do we get, how do we get it out there? Um, how do we get people to do it? Um, we at NEP are seeing, um, in the last couple of years, a really um, interesting sort of movement. And I don't know whether it's to do with Extinction Rebellion or the Climate Change Revolution or the Plastics Revolution. But suddenly, people are thinking much more freely and much more positively about how we, our landscape should look in the future. We had um, um, Charlie likes to add up the acreage of people who come to visit NEP. And this year, we had farmers and landowners, land managers, who, uh, between them, owned over a million acres. So that's a really significant amount of people coming to look at NEP with serious interest in rewilding their own land. But I think it's one thing to come to NEP and say, appreciate it and say, we love what you do. It's another to go back to your own patch and make this leap. And I think one thing that really holds people back, and us perhaps too in the beginning, is this aesthetic that we've grown up with, this idea that our landscape should be managed and controlled. It makes us feel safe somehow. And quite often, we've grown up in landscapes like this that we feel nostalgically attached to, even if we know that they're not functioning like they should. So I think rewilding is as much about um, understanding how rewilding can work for us, what the huge benefits it can bring, as it is about learning how to let go, how to get messy again. Um, how to kind of rid ourselves of our corseted Victorian obsession with tidying up and just get out there and, 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 and relish the unpredictability of things, the boom and bust cycles of nature and animals that might be doing strange things in strange places and things that we never expected, to really relish that, that as a goal. So I think ultimately it's about changing a mindset. And that happens not out there. It happens in here. It's about changing our own minds. It's, it's ultimately about rewilding ourselves. Thank you.
Yeah, absolutely. We, we have to abide by, for the de-domesticated de animals, we have to abide by all the regulations that um, any other normal farmer has to do. So um, if there is an animal that is sick or has broken a leg or a cow that has trouble calving, and this is very rare, um, then, of course, we get the vet in. And um, if they have to be treated with um, something that um, is non-organic, we take them out of the system. We do our best to treat them organically. Uh, but if not, we take them out of the system until they're better and the chemicals have gone through them, and then we put them back into the rewilding project. Um, but we have to abide by these regulations. And one of the things we're going to be trying to do, trying to, trying to do, and, and so uh, Rewilding Europe, it's a wonderful organization, Rewilding Europe. It's got a fantastic website. Certainly recommend you look at that because it's got huge, huge projects in Europe that are kicking off that are really exciting. And they're all using free-roaming animals as the drivers, including bison and beavers. Um, and wild horses and, and cattle. Um, in fact, they're trying to breed cattle back to the aurochs. Um, but um, what, so what we're, we're hoping is that we can get a dispensation to have a more relaxed regulations because um, we're supposed to check our pigs twice a day. Um, and that's that's if you've got if fine if you've got your pig in a pen, you know. But out there, sometimes we don't see them for a week. Um, <laughs> when we had the soil association inspector come, you know, he eventually found the pigs. And um, he said they were the best-looking pigs he'd ever seen. And of course they're fine. Um, but, you know, so, so it, it is difficult to... And we have to ear-tag the, the, the calves within weeks of them being born. They could be born in a you know, thorny scrub in the middle of nowhere. So it's very challenging. Um, but, yeah, we, we, we do absolutely have, have veterinary protection for the animals. Um, yes? So what's the video for the Oh, I see. Oh, okay, you want the logistics? Yeah. Okay, about the, about the safari. Uh, okay, um, well, um, we have a little farm shop yeah. where we hope that people will buy our free, wild-range, ethical, self-medicating, organic meat. Um, um, and uh, we sell other things in the shop. So um, it's, it's you, 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 you provide for yourself, basically, and we have parcels. You bring your own food. So you bring your own food, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is a really important income stream for us. Um, we have so many um, people wanting to see wildlife that we suddenly thought, well, you know, why don't we do um, a, a business based on a kind of African safari system? Why, you don't need to travel for the whole way to Africa to see the big five. We've got five you can come <laughs> and see here. Um, and um, and it's, been, it's been fantastic. So we have glamping and camping and we have safaris. Um, and it, it's not quite the African weather, but the punters <laughs> don't seem to mind. And we have fantastic ecologists who take you around and teach you about, you know, the systems and show you whatever wildlife is, you know, there in, at that season. Yeah. Yeah. That's the video. Yeah. So, but since there are no natural predators now, do you have ranging birds and the help of the balance? Do you have hunting or do you? We cull the animals. So we, we it's like, a bit like ranching. Um, so the deer are shot, the, 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 the cows and the, uh, and the pigs uh, um, are taken off to an abattoir. Um, so to my mind, the abattoir bit is not great. Um, uh, I like to think they have one bad day in their lives. We would like to have an on-site um, mobile abattoir, um, if we can manage that, um, um, where they get killed. Um, and um, so we would like to have it absolutely in-house so they don't have to travel at all. Um, but uh, uh, that's how we manage the system. And as again, again, as I say, we keep the stocking density very low so that you have this dynamic with the vegetation succession. But it's, I think, a, a demonstration, because uh, obviously the meat production is a big income stream for us, um, to other farmers who are looking to change to something like this. That they're, you know, it's, and I think, you know, increasingly, I think, I think we, we have to stop industrially farming meat. It's unconscionable to be feeding grain to cows. Um, and uh, it's bad for the animals too, and it's bad for us who eat that kind of product. Um, but it's unsustainable. And so we've got to lower our, our meat intake, but if we do eat meat, then I think we need to think very carefully about where it comes from. So we do feel that there's, there's an increasing kind of interest in, in these sources of, 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 of meat. Yeah. So how are you going to handle one or two of them? 
someone from the back. Yes, sir, at the back. Well, I, um, I, I think, um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with a statistician who sadly died just a, a year or so ago called Hans Rosling about the populations across the globe. Um, but I found his research very reassuring. Um, you know, as we know, we are already feeding a population of 11 billion, and we're 7.5 billion now. So we know the resources are there. We know we can produce actually even more food than that sustainably on the same amount of land if we, would, if we switch to regenerative farming. Um, Africa is a problem. So that is the place where the main continent where um, the, the, the birth rate continues to rise. Um, but elsewhere, it's dropping. Um, we know that um, elsewhere on the globe, we have actually stabilized. So um, we are, you know, our, our population globally will increase while, while the generations catch up. Um, but our, our actual birth rate has plateaued. So the, the, the big challenge, I think, is going to be pulling Africa out of poverty. Because as soon as you pull people out of poverty, they have fewer children. As soon as you give um, control to women and education, they have children much later, and they have fewer of them. Um, and they think longer term, and you, you break a cycle. Um, over here, perhaps, yeah. Um, are you making cuts now? Yeah, this is a real. Yeah, this is a really, really important question. I mean, we still get um, subsidy. We still get an EU subsidy. God knows what's going to happen to that. Um, but um, we are hoping that that subsidy, which is an agri-environment subsidy, so it's it's rewarding us for restoring, doing all these things that we're doing, um, will be replaced. Um, once and if we leave Brexit, the government will replace it with something that called ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, um, which will be rewarding farmers for the first time, not for producing food to, irrespective of the damage it causes, but for producing food responsibly and for doing all these responsible things to their soils and carbon sequestration and everything else. So we hope that there will still be payments that will incentivize people to treat the land more, respect more respectfully. But even if that goes, and no one likes to rely on subsidies because we know what you know, the whims of governments are, um, that we will be sustainable because we have these three main income streams, the meat, um, the ecotourism, and we also have all these agricultural buildings, um, which you know, as a farmer just cost an arm and a leg to keep the roof on. They're, they don't give you anything. They're just part of the infrastructure you need for farming, for industrial farming. Um, but now, admittedly, with a bit of capital outlay, we are converting those into storage space, um, into light industrial use, and for office space. So we've converted, I think, half of them already. Um, and there is demand in, 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 in Britain, but quite a widespread demand over Britain, I think, um, for people who don't want to sit in a traffic jam getting to the nearest city to go to work. They're quite happy to have a lovely office looking out on pigs diving for swan mussels. Um, <laughs> So we've put in fast broadband, and those, those buildings are now a very lucrative income stream for us. Um, interestingly, those buildings, um, even though we aren't directly employing the people in them, they're rented by other companies, but those companies are now together employing 200 people. So that's 200 people back in the rural economy, which is revitalizing um, our part of the countryside. We've got time. <laughs>